Welcome back to our monthly Tango Alpha Lima Be The One podcast. I'm your host, Amy Forsyth, and I'll be here on the first of each month with guests who provide expertise, resources, and peer-to-peer support as part of the American Legion's Be The One initiative to prevent suicide within the veteran community. Learn more at betheone.org, and let's get today's conversation started. Today, our guest is Dr. Regan Stegman, Associate Professor of Preventative and Lifestyle Medicine and the Director of Digital Health Track at Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Parker, Colorado. Dr. Stegman served in the U.S. Air Force for 11 years and most recently as a flight surgeon and lifestyle and performance medicine specialist with the 10th Operational Medical Readiness Squadron at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Dr. Stegman is passionate about human performance, optimization, positive psychology, and health promotion, and we're glad to have her with us today. Thank you so much for joining us on Be The One podcast. Amy, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to share some uh, foundational knowledge uh, that can potentially maybe even change your life. So I'm excited to jump into this. We have such an amazing background and just really um, working with high performers as pilots, right? Can you give us a little bit about your background in the military? Um, And then we'll talk about your transition and where things are today for you. Absolutely. So uh, my background in the military uh, is pretty unique. Uh, I actually am the first of my family to join the services. And um, I I also come from a medical family. So I figured it would be uh, quite the adventure to partake in not only going to medical school, but seeing what kind of adventures would come down the road, um, joining as an Air Force officer. Um, And uh, adventures come down the pike, did they ever? So uh, I deployed in 2020 to the Middle East. Um, I was stationed at Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland, where I did uh, my residency training in preventive medicine and lifestyle medicine. Uh, I did some preliminary work in um, Columbus, Georgia, so just south of Atlanta, um, and really um, just paved a a novel path for myself and my family to experience by proxy and through me uh, what service life really looked like. So um, it was it was a whirlwind, but uh, an experience that I couldn't trade for any other. Well, wonderful. Well, while you were on active duty, what was your primary job, you know, entry into the Air Force? So um, after I did all of my med school training and residency training, um, I immediately went to AMP or aerospace medical primary training and became a flight surgeon. So um, sort of counterintuitive, just like the surgeon general is not a surgeon. I'm not doing surgery in the air or anything clever like that. Uh, But really, I'm trying to dial in the health and optimization and performance of some of the most um, elite military members, and those are pilots. So I'm focusing on things like primary care delivery, Uh, preventive medicine, lifestyle medicine, occupational medicine, to make sure that we have a strong fighting force that's ready to go uh, as frequently as possible. And in the past 10 or 15 years, you've seen probably such tremendous strides in techniques and ways to help our pilots and those elite war fighters. Um, What are some things that you've seen that you've noticed that have been helpful just in that short period of time with your experience? Amy, that's a that's a phenomenal question, and one of the most impactful and most relevant. Um, we'll call it an evolution, even though it's not really new. But um, is this field of lifestyle medicine that you have referenced previously? So, uh, lifestyle medicine, in a nutshell, is an evidence based approach to preventing, treating, and reversing some of the most chronic, uh, common diseases that we see. So high blood pressure, high cholesterol, pre-diabetes, diabetes, diabetes, overweight, obesity, um, some of the diseases that are now disproportionately affecting and impacting our service members and certainly our veterans as well. Um, And and I'll say um, over the course of my 11 years in uniform, I have seen a really rapid um, uptake and sort of recalibration on behalf of uh, senior leaders in the Department of Defense. Um, who have really started to realize that this is where the rubber meets the road from the standpoint of um, helping the medical world or MTFs, military treatment facilities, really capture um, health maintenance as opposed to what the current system is, which is disease management. 
Um, so really just providing a choice for patients, certainly our warfighters that deserve to be optimized at all times because they have to deploy and go into, into theater and, you know, get, get in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, so I really will say lifestyle medicine has been incredibly life-changing, not just for me as a physician provider, but for my patients too. Like go figure, humans actually want to get healthy or want the opportunity to get healthy. And that's exactly what we're achieving through implementing lifestyle medicine or what we in the military call lifestyle and performance medicine. Well, and for, especially for those pilots, the amount of physical and mental stress that we ask them to put on them while they're performing is just so intense. And so this actually is, um, you know, at the forefront, I think other services are realizing there's benefit and value, especially for those elite war fighters. Um, and now that you've transitioned to the civilian sector, uh, can you describe how that's been and what your next, you know, focus is going to be as, as now uh, working in um, with academia and research and helping your patients? You bet. Um, so really, you know, having pivoted out of active duty and into the civilian sector now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm still really invested in this space of lifestyle medicine or lifestyle and performance medicine. And I'll say if any demographic deserves it or needs it the most, it's our warfighters who are on active duty service currently and, and their families to boot. Um, so not only have I um, been in the realm of academia for about five years now teaching at Rocky Vista, um, but I'm actually helping to consult back to the Department of Defense and other entities like the VA um, to, to really help establish this continuous uh, common language and this standardized approach to healthcare delivery. Um, and it, it's really catching on rapidly. And I'm so pleased to see that because, you know, in, in a nutshell, lifestyle medicine is based on six pillars, what you eat, how you move, how you sleep, how you think, how you moderate risky substance use, and how you mitigate stress with a huge focus on what you're eating, uh, because that is the foundation. You know, the analogy that I like to use, Amy, is, um, if you're building a house, you have to make sure that the foundation is strong before you start doing something like uh, renovations or, uh, you know, repair, because if you're fixing a roof or if you're trying to, you know, build, build a new room, it's, it's just going to collapse unless you have that true foundation of, of health under your belt, so to speak. And I like to equate, equate those uh, repairs or um, those renovations as things like chronic disease that people just presume you get as you age. And, you know, I'm here loud and proud to be one of those healthcare professionals to professionals to bust that myth, uh, because it, it really is what we're actually doing to our bodies on a daily basis, on a habit basis, on a lifestyle basis within those six pillars that is going to make or break our physiology as human beings. So we might as well optimize it, right? Because having medical conditions is no fun. And especially knowing that we can actually heal our cells and heal our biology and heal our brains and our mental health issues at some points too. It's really profound. So um, I'm continuing to find really captivated audiences for um, helping to spread this narrative of lifestyle medicine so that people can actually start uh, embodying it and enacting it. That's fantastic. You know, um, in those early days for me in the military, there was no mention of nutrition and fitness or well-being. It was just, uh, here's your food, you eat it or you don't eat it. And um, so I'm so really pleased to hear um, how you've taken that concept and gotten the attention of senior leaders within the DOD and then really making this a top priority. Uh, what are some resources that other people who might be listening can tap into that you found very helpful, um, whether you're still on active duty or you're now transitioned to a veteran? There is um, no, uh, it's not too late. It's never too late to start with health and well-being. So if someone's just getting started or being more aware of the things that they need to do to really maximize their performance, what are some resources that you like? That you'd recommend, Amy. Uh, you're you're spot on, and I really do want to footstomp that idea of you are never too too old to start. And I think that's where a lot of people just keep hearing that narrative of just like, oh, 
these are the, the ailments that I'm going to get as I age. Like you have to intercept that thinking right now. Like let today be that pivotal, you know, reflection point or that recalibration point in your lives um, where you can actually have an objective discussion and figure out, hey, what are those six pillars? What do they look like in my life? How can I assess my current status? And then how can I figure out how I'm going to change those little habits bit by bit over time? Because they synergize. Um, and I'll, I'll share a really remarkable article that was just published uh, last week. So the last week of July, um, that really helps put this into perspective. And so some of the, the recommendations for resources, Amy, that I share with almost all my patients um, come out of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, and I'll say, you know, it's really easy to, to Google some of these references and resources. Um, food as medicine. Medicine is one of my favorites. You can just type in lifestyle medicine, food as medicine, um, and it'll give you a really smart uh, PDF. And I'll actually make sure we have the link to share with listeners um, and viewers as well. Um, and even doing things like how to how to eat healthier, uh, like eating more plant forward foods, eating foods that have higher fiber value. Those are the foods that are going to actively de-inflame your body, help get rid of disease, help mitigate those mental health components like anxiety, depression, things like that. Um, and you can do it on a budget too. You don't have to break the bank doing this. A lot of people have misconceptions about what healthier eating might look like. So tons of resources coming out of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, as well as uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine as well. There's some great uh, patient-facing materials. Um, really just helps to coax the, the, the opportunity to ask questions the right way for the, the patient or the veteran and the family members, because a lot of the time you do not know the questions that you are not asking, and that is make or break for a health profile. So once again, we're here as a you know, healthcare professional agnostic. It's not just physicians driving this charge. It's nurses, it's PAs, it's physical therapists, it's pharmacists, it's dietitians who are coming together in sort of a family unit to, to provide that standardized communication of evidence-based approaches to lifestyle um, and then to share that and scale that. Um, so tons of resources out there. Uh, but make sure make sure they're vetted. Um, so Harvard's got some great ones on a lot more like plant forward leaning, nutrition leaning. Uh, Dr. Walter Willett out of Harvard is a reliable resource as well. Um, but yeah, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, um, great starts. Well, all these topics um, really lead to our, our core mission here at Be The One podcast, where um, whether it's health and fitness, um, diet, sleep, all these things, if they're off balance, could lead people to having more of um, mental health issues or disturbances or not being able to process information that could uh, trigger symptoms of suicide or, you know, just an unbalanced um, mental well-being. What you're putting in your body is and can make you not just physically sick, but mentally sick as well. Can you, can you tell Tell our viewers and our listeners what could be a trigger that they're unaware of at this point. Absolutely. And, and I really appreciate you bringing up that point. And uh, the nuance really comes into this um, sort of a scientific analogy where we're looking at things like a mental health diagnosis or a mental health issue through a microscope when we really need to be looking at it through a fisheye lens or like a wide a wide angle lens to, to account for exactly what you were saying, Amy. Um, is it your poor diet choices that you're making because you're emotionally eating, uh, which a lot of Americans do. I, I would wager the disproportionate amount of Americans are, are not taught how to self-regulate and to, you know, don't just reach for that bag of spicy Cheetos because that's reflexive. And that's what you're, you know, we call it the lizard brain and the wizard brain over here. And of course the lizard brain is going to say, why, yes, I would like that fast food, delicious French fry and ketchup option, um, as opposed to a healthy handful of blueberries or an apple, because that's the instinct. That's what our, you know, our Neanderthal, uh, predecessors would have gone for uh, in a fight or flight state. But once again, we're over here engaging the wizard brain through lifestyle medicine to say, hey, let's strategically stop, pivot. Are you really thirsty? Are you hungry? Are Where's that, that thin line to be drawn um, to figuring out, once again, those foundational components of is it because you haven't been moving? Is your physical activity low? Is your exercise capacity low because you're sleeping poorly? Once again, it's really triangulating, or I guess, hexangulating all of these six pillars of lifestyle medicine into um, how that could be affecting your mental health at large. And I think a really interesting thing to bring up too, Amy, is this idea 
um, that connecting the dots, mental health disorders like major depressive disorder um, and clinical symptoms of depression that might be, you know, not necessarily overt, but we call them subclinical sometimes, um, can absolutely overlap with serious me medical diagnoses like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Um, and that can further exacerbate the burden of those diseases. And so it behooves us to strategically stop, recalibrate, reassess, and maybe revisit that foundation of that proverbial house. And think of yourself as a house, your, your health house. Think of it that way. When was the last time you actually stopped and said, wow, how much fiber am I actually eating in my diet? How many ounces of water am I act actively consuming on a daily basis? How many minutes of physical activity am I getting on a daily basis? Similarly with sleep. So um, it's a really uh, profound connection that I think um, falls by the wayside sometimes. And we sort of lose that for forest for the trees uh, idea when we're approaching how to effectively um, address mental health issues. Well, we are so lucky to have you with your expertise and being a veteran, you're going on to shine and really provide people those needed um, resources. Now you're, you're a legionnaire, you're, um, you're a proud member. Uh, tell us what posts that you've been affiliated with. So I am, I am now a member of Post 209 uh, out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and I specifically asked for the largest post in Colorado, and rightfully so, because I really do believe that, you know, this message belongs in the hands and in the brains of, one, anyone who is interested in learning about truly optimizing their physiology, reclaiming their health, figuring out how to reverse chronic disease if they're interested um, you know, I really like to put that out there for people like how, how many times have you sat in a doctor's office and your doc has talked to you about coming off of blood pressure medication or coming off of cholesterol meds or reversing prediabetes or diabetes or things like that. Um, and sadly, the answer is not too common. Um, and, and this is exactly what we hope to, to shift around. And I hope to share this far and wide, not only with, uh, you know, American Legion uh, team members and legionnaires and everyone like that, but uh, with anybody who wants to listen, this is just the science, and I'm I'm a medical professional, so I should be delivering the science to to any and everyone. And what are you hearing and seeing out there as some trends um, on the forefront? I mean, this seems very new concept, even though it's it's ages old, but uh, really foot stomping the impact that our food supply and our sources are um, deteriorating. So it's more important to really pay attention to what we're what we're eating and uh, how we're living our life for better health, for day-to-day -day improvements. What are you seeing out there? What are some trends that people can be aware of? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, you know, um, understanding the, the great country in which we live and understanding also some of the um, less uh, favorable, we'll call them, uh, attributes of them. And I'll give you a great example, the weight loss industry, multi-billion dollar industry, um, panders on the, the American and all of us that want to have lost you know, 10 pounds yesterday. And I think that's something to be very cautious about uh, because you'll see cycles and one is repeating currently. So uh, 20 years ago, uh, you'll, you'll perhaps remember the, the Atkins diet or the South Beach diet, which looks remarkably like keto or paleo. And um, what do those what do those pander on? They they pander on short term gains, and where lifestyle medicine pivots um, specifically and very distinctly differentiating from that is lifestyle medicine is the long game, and I have never met somebody who wanted to lose weight and just gain back the same amount or perhaps even gain back even more than when they lost. Um, so it behooves us to be smarter consumers in this country as well, um, and I really do. You know, I come from a farm family in the in the Midwest. Um, my my father's from Illinois and my mom's from Iowa, and we still have. Have, you know, a ton of land out there, corn and soy in the Midwest. And so, you know, I wasn't born in this space where I just, uh, you know, flipped a switch and said, hey, guess what? I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat a lot of plants, which is sort of contrary to the standard American diet. And then I did all the work. I went to medical school. I went to residency. I joined the military. I, I went into one of the most specific fields of medicine to learn how to vet the research the right way. I combed every single layer of research trying to figure this out because guess what? As a physician, I'm in charge of people's health. I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily want to just be in charge of managing your disease when I can help cure it. So um, I did all this research. I learned all these things. And then what did I do? I applied that to my life. There's a great quote from Maya Angelou that says, do the best with what you know, but then when you know better, do better. And so, you know, it was only about 10 years ago that I started really dialing in the food choices I was making because I was seeing all this research coming out that basically in a nutshell shows 
the standard American diet causes standard American disease. And what do we love in this country? Um, we love tons of, you know, red meats, animal products, cheeses. I get it. You know, I, I'm, I'm on that pathway to course correcting, eating more fiber, all that kind of stuff too. And, you know, I, it gets very, um, sensitive at some points because there's a huge identity piece attached to how we eat our food and how we identify, especially in the military. You think of like burger burns and you think of what like a macho man or woman might look like. And your your reflex isn't to think, well, that person's definitely, you know, very, very musculature laden and swole and ripped and jacked by eating plants. And I think those are some of the myths that we have to start dispelling. And, and I'll say, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing either. And that's the beauty part of this. So I, myself, I call myself a flexitarian. So I eat a significant number of plants, I'm about 95% plant forward, but guess what? I'm a human too. I love pizza. I love sushi. I love having a bite of filet mignon here because that's, that's what I grew up with. And to be fair, my taste buds have changed over time, but also to be fair, that is now the treat. That's not what's on my meal plate three times a day for the, the rest of my life. And I think that's the recalibration that I found that I get to share, that I get to be the living, breathing proof of, hey, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is as a physician. I'm going to show up in the doc's office with my patient, be a living, breathing example of that. And once again, Amy, just giving patients the choice to make. I have no heartburn if, you know, you want to manage your medicate your your medical diseases with pharmaceuticals or symptom management as opposed to going to the root cause. That's your prerogative. We're Americans. We get to make that choice. But it, I'm doing you a disservice if you do not have that choice to know that it is absolutely possible to reverse chronic diseases like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, metabolic uh, deoptimization, um, cognitive performance, even chronic pain. Um, some of these diseases you'll notice very high disproportionately affecting veterans. So once again, it's it's our due, due diligence to bring this to light, bring this lifestyle medicine narrative to light so that vets and uh, military families and war fighters who are in active duty service status can start implementing this if they so wish. They just have to have a team to do it with. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, you mentioned something that is very at odds now with the with the VA and um, veterans and military members who are instantly get given prescription meds and kind of seen a chronic problem with that. Can you can you talk about that and you know give some comfort to people if they're looking for an alternative? I wouldn't say even alternative, but just a, another way to manage pain or. Um, you know, you mentioned with the diet and maybe some other type therapies, whether it's um, physical exercise or uh, talk therapy or just some other ways of helping themselves um, develop a lifestyle change that's needed. Absolutely. And, and Amy, I really, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I really, I really want people to once again, find a place to reclaim your voice and to use your voice in your doctor's office, because only now is the realm of lifestyle medicine growing as one of the fastest uh, expanding medical subspecialties. And rightfully so, once again, um, I like to equate it sort of to um, addiction medicine or obesity medicine that have been around for uh, several decades now. Um, but really do use your voice and talk to your medical team about what options might exist because, you know, I'm telling you right here uh, from the standpoint of how things like physical activity or things like actively de-inflaming your body might impact a, uh, a pain scale uh, or a chronic pain issue that's just never been touched by a pharmaceutical. Um, and, you know, the connection that I like to make in this space, Amy, is this idea that most pharmaceuticals um, manage symptoms and they do not go to the root of the problem. We'll circle right back to that. You are a house of health. And if your foundation is insufficient, every renovation, every repair you try to make is going to be potentially collapsing in on itself because there's nothing to sustain it. There are no strong pillars to hold it. So um, I would definitely say, you know, do your due diligence. You can, you know, across the U.S. and even now internationally, you can Google lifestyle medicine professionals in your area, try and find somebody who might be speaking your language. Um, I do know that uh, the VA is uh, growing out the whole health sector of the VA. Uh, be aware that it is quite disparate and it's not the same in every location. For example, um, Tampa VA in Florida has a very robust whole health presence that is very well steeped in lifestyle medicine. Some of my great colleagues are down there. 
um, but other places, not so much. So once again, your, your words are power and making those um, desires known. I mean, let's leverage the platform we're in. Talk to your, your team and your leaders at, at your posts and let them know, hey, I'm interested. Doc Stigman was talking about lifestyle medicine. How do we make this an active component of something, for example, that a veteran service organization like the American Legion could actively invest in? Because Amy, the, the nuts and bolts of this conversation is how do we get to sustainable optimization of the human body? And that means, guess what? We, we watch those uh, chronic diseases or those chronic issues melt away or get substantially improved or your quality of life just drastically changes just because you dialed in those six pillars of lifestyle medicine. So um, I think having the conversation with your healthcare professional about what's available, even if it might not be through the VA, that's just going to be a, a, a necessary um, pivot that you might have to make for the time being. But I don't think that should stop anyone from learning more uh, on their own as well. And once again, you can do that, go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, um, look up food as medicine, just make sure you're, you're tracking the source that it's coming from as well. Well, wonderful message for people still in the military. And of course, when people retire or they become a veteran, they they get their DD-214 and step off. Life is just beginning when you leave active duty. You've got your whole life in front of you and you want to make it a healthy one and make healthy choices. But I do want to go back to when you were on active duty and you were supporting those elite war fighters and those active duty folks. The um, kind of getting some loud voices to talk about those weight standards and, and managing those weight standards, which kind of triggers some mental health issues because the standards are so strict by by what is now a modern sort of society in our culture. Um, can you talk to that and what your experience was with, especially for women, maybe the health standards or the weight standards were unrealistic and for men who like to weight lift, or can you tell us some things that you were seeing um, in terms of those weights, those really strict weight standards? Absolutely. I think, I think this touches on once again, um, the, the way that we really need to reframe investing in those foundational six pillars of health, because um, in the military, I know this wasn't unique to, to many people either was that you knew when your uh, PT test was coming up and you might not do much consistent exercise the 11 months leading up to that 12th month where you know you're going to train and it becomes this weekend warrior mentality when we as a enterprise of the DOD or, um, you know, for especially for active duty service members have to find the right way to incentivize patients to um, invest long term. Once again, this is the long game, Amy. And so when you're showing up and, and saying, hey, I haven't trained for, uh, you know, 350 days of the year and, you know, 20, 20, 15, 20 days later, you're about to take your PT test. That's sort of defeatist. That's defeating the purpose here because, you know, we're, we're trying to incentivize um, active investment in things like physical activity to look at things like proxy markers for cardiovascular disease, things of that nature. Um, so once again, it really would behoove uh, the DOD as an enterprise and the VA as an enterprise to say, how do we help patients reassess these negative feedback loops that people find themselves in. And we alluded to it earlier when, you know, if we're talking about mental health and are, are you in a mental health rut because you're overweight and your weight isn't shifting. And when you go to the doctor, they're telling you eat less and work out more, which worked for no one. Like there's no strategy in how to optimally really get buy-in and engagement. And, you know, I, I really like to reference, you know, whether it's Frederick Nietzsche or Viktor Frankl or Simon Sinek about, you know, what is your why? We really have to go back to the service member in particular who is, you know, potentially at any minute able to, you know, deploy at last, at, la at you know, a moment's notice. They have to be ready. They have to not just be ready to deploy, Amy, they have to be optimized to deploy. So we have to build that infrastructure for them to really figure out how to personalize their personal why and say, oh, okay, well, let me make a smarter decision, you know, at before noon today, as opposed to just trying to conceptualize it over the course of a decade. So, you know, we, we call this idea having a non-zero day. So if that means, hey, guess what? I'm going to eat one more nectarine today or one more apple or one more serving of zucchini. That's going to up your fiber intake, like magic number for fiber intake that everyone should be hitting every day, Amy, between 25 and 30 grams of fiber. 
if you do the objective assessment that we talked about before, and we said, oh my goodness, I am only meeting 12 grams of fiber a day, which is average for American, by the way, 95% of Americans are not getting their daily recommended intake of fiber, for example. And that's what's contributing to chronic pain, chronic disease, you name it, this laundry list of things that we're referencing. So it's strategically engaging and uh, dare I say, operationalizing lifestyle medicine um, for the individual warfighter and for their family to make the, the right rungs work and meet up and align for them. And this is what I reference when I'm saying, hey, this is not an all or nothing lift in lifestyle medicine, particularly in the food realm. This is an all or something lift. So what are the small little nuggets that you could do today to maybe add an additional serving or two uh, to up your fiber intake? Can you get out after dinner and even take a, a walk to the end of the block? Those are the things that are going to start intercepting those negative habits that we've accrued. And we call it, you know, most Americans have been humming along at the status quo plateau. Most patients, most people in this country do not know that their life doesn't have to be at this status quo level, that they could just bump it right up by dialing in their lifestyle choices on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, which helps then 180 what they've experienced for probably most of their lives. So a really, really relevant discussion to be having for the warfighter in particular, um, when, you know, it's it's interesting, Amy, that there's Air Force Instructional 48-101, Aerospace Medical Enterprise, which governs how I, as a flight surgeon, should be offering uh, health and wellness to fly, uh, flyers. And that's human performance optimization. So isn't it interesting that Lifestyle Med seems to dovetail perfectly with this human performance optimization movement for optimal warfighter performance. That's such great advice. And so for all those uh, military leaders out there, whether enlisted, senior enlisted leaders, your, your um, officers out there in a leadership role, or just a coach or a mentor, what are what would you tell them or what were you telling your commanding officers and guiding them into how to interact with troops and um, help educate them and then provide the means to get referrals, to get the help they need or learn more? Because none of this is taught in, you know, high school or college necessarily. So some most people in the military don't ever get or hear these ways to optimize their performance. But what advice and guidance would you give to people out there who can make an impact um, on a lot of people within our ranks? Uh, I think that's great. And I think, you know, that's exactly what we're actively working on now. Um, and in, in an effort to cons consult more consistently back to the Department of Defense to be that sort of uh, that link to sustainability and saying, hey, guess what, whether it looks like we're investing in education so that we know that the entire um, military treatment facility team is going to be steeped, at least in part, with one healthcare professional who's trained in lifestyle medicine, who's certified in lifestyle medicine, for example. Um, that's that's one big area that we have to focus on, because we all know that if we want to get things done, we're going to have to invest in not just you know a single point of opportunity, but in a multi-point, multi-year effort to change that landscape, to invest differently in that landscape. And I'll give you an interesting um, point of discussion that came up that I was super proud of. So Air Force, uh, which obviously that was um, my branch, but uh, as of uh, next year, so September, uh, June of 2024, they are going to have the first official lifestyle and performance medicine billet at the Defense Health Headquarters and rightfully so, so that we might have um, a, a more central presence in delivering this kind of healthcare on a more consistent basis. And, and I'm so stoked on that because once again, this is going to help um, create the uh, reliable um, pathways and opportunities to help leverage this at each um, military base or post or uh, wherever you might be in the world. And I think, you know, on, on a smaller scale, Amy, when it comes to commanders really just sh truly showing up um, and not just, you know, talking the talk, not walking the walk, but we, we socialize this idea of um, having effective stop and swap opportunities. Um, the military is no stranger to, you know, bringing donuts and muffins and a bunch of less healthy foods to meetings, for example. Um, I know that I still walk into uh, a handful of uh, locations on base and there's candy dishes. And so like, what's a smart and effective and useful and not cost prohibitive way to affect that? Well, okay, go to Sam's Club, go to Costco, grab a bag of tangerines, something 
simple like that. Uh, and it's funny, it's happening. I had a colleague of mine snap a photo of, um, you know, the, the middle of the conference table uh, out in the national capital region. And she, she said, look, it's happening. Senior leadership is bringing, you know, fruits and carrot sticks and things to munch on that aren't just blind uh, reflexive, grab a bag of chips and eat the whole thing before you know it, eating. And this is a more active, invested, like, wow, I'm actively ticking off all those grams of fiber that I know I'm going to eat and need on a daily basis. So, you know, making smarter choices, the easier choices to invest in. Um, and we are, we're really approaching that from a, a, a multifaceted lift. So it's not just the healthcare professionals, Amy, for example, it's the the FSS, the Force Support Squadrons, and it's a AFSVC, Air Force Services Center, the people who are procuring the food, for example, like we have to be working in tandem with them. Uh, and that's just one example of this um, multi-professional lift to actually change the landscape for an enterprise like the DOD. Well, it's wonderful advice and small strides uh, can make a big difference in the course of careers. And we're so lucky to have you as part of uh, this series, Be The One podcast. And so um, before we wrap things up, is there anything else you'd like to add and share with our audience out there? I, I would. And, and, you know, I had referenced it as we were talking previously, actually just this past week. So uh, I think it was 24 July, there was a publication that came out that uh, there was, it was actually focused on the Million Veteran Program. So uh, there was a, it was about 720,000 military veterans between the ages of 40 and 99. And they were all part of this military veteran program. And they did a longitudinal study that was showing the health and wellness of US veterans. And um, the beautiful part here, and I'm just gonna read it to you because it's so impactful. Uh, it leads off with, do you want to live up to an additional 24 years? Just add eight healthy lifestyle choices to your life at age 40, and that could happen. Are you starting at age 50 instead? No problem. You could prolong your life up to 21 years, this study found. Age 60, you still can gain nearly 18 years if you adopt all eight healthy habits. And, and I, I really just want to foot stomp this idea that truly you are never too old to start dialing in healthier options for harnessing biophysiologic optimization. That is what we, we are designed as incredible human entities. We, we're designed to not only heal, but we're built to perform, but we have to give our bodies that chance to heal first and foremost. So once again, it's really finding that sweet spot for those six pillars of lifestyle medicine, the biggest one, the heaviest impact being um, the, the diet piece. We have to start shifting away from super processed foods, tons of saturated fat, tons of cholesterol, tons of sugar, tons of artificial everything. Eat things that don't have ingredients labels like broccoli and apple. And I get it. Like you can make a broccoli taste like garbage, just like you can make a pork chop taste like garbage. It comes with, uh, you know, you got to refine your art in that space too. And, and, you know, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has tons of references, tons of even links to um, menus and uh, recipes, things of that nature. It's, it's once again, it's making the small steps that will add up to the big steps, but you just got to start making them somewhere. So um the world's your oyster. And we're, we're here as lifestyle medicine experts to help guide you and help get you away from that status quo plateau and to a, a healthier baseline. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Regan Stiegman for the inspiration. And we're going to put uh, all the things you mentioned in the show notes so people can know where to go and find more information, uh, maybe even some recipes, or you can send us your favorite, uh, maybe meal prepping or, you know, some links that you like. And so we just really appreciate your time today for the Be The One podcast. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. And we'll keep the conversation going. That sounds perfect. I just want to remember, I want to remind everyone that uh, one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Carlyle is, he who has health has hope and he who has hope has everything. So run with that, regain your health and uh, turn a new leaf. Thank you so much. Wonderful to connect with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest today and sharing this information with our listeners. And thank you, Alphas, for tuning in to the Tango Alpha Lima Be The One podcast. Remember, you can be the one to save one veteran. 
find resources and more information at be the one.org and connect with the American Legion on social media to keep the conversation going. Don't forget to subscribe to the Tango Alpha Lima podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And please share a podcast with others. We'll see you next month on Be The One Podcast. On the first day of every month, American Legion family members are encouraged to wear Be The One apparel to publicly show their commitment to reducing the stigma around mental health issues. Go to BeTheOne.org to learn how you can be the one to save one veteran. If you're a veteran in crisis or concerned about one, call the Veterans Crisis Line at 988 and press 1. You're not alone. The Veterans Crisis Line is here for you and you don't have to be enrolled in the VA. Help is available and speak with someone today.